Thank you so much for joining on to our webinar this morning. We are excited to have Lauren Lurkins on to talk a little bit about the crossroads between carbon and corn. We will have a question and answer period at the end. And so if you have any questions, feel free to send those in to the chat and we will moderate those. And if we don't get your question answered, we will go ahead and send you an email with some more information on that. So Lauren, if you wouldn't mind kicking it off for us today. Awesome. Thank you, Haley, and thanks everybody for joining us today. And we know it's a busy time of year with harvest, so um, we're using technology to reach you, and you can either watch this on your free time or while you're out and about in the fields. But um, as Haley said, my name is Lauren Lurkins. Um, I have my own consulting firm these days, Lurkins Strategies LLC, but I want to tell you a little bit about my background, and then we'll get into, um, into the discussion here today. Um, I have a background in environmental science and geology uh, with uh, focus um, from the St. Louis University. I then went to law school at SIU Carbondale and um, focused on environmental law after I graduated there. I spent about seven years at an environmental law firm um, in our state capital. Uh, at that time, I represented drinking water, wastewater utilities, some farmers, ag retail, as well as ethanol plants as they tried to get their air and water permits from state and federal environmental agencies. And then I was privileged to spend the last 10 years at the Illinois Farm Bureau working on environmental policy. Um, the issues included water quality, fertilizer, pesticide, um, climate change, and many of those uh, issues, uh, I collaborated a lot with the Illinois corn growers. So over the summer, I, I opened up my own consulting firm. Um, in my role now, I represent a variety of trade associations in that same environmental work, um, some academic uh, support, and then also some sustainability advising for um, venture capital and investors. So a lot of exciting work. Um, I am very excited to be working alongside Illinois corn growers to do a series of meetings um, with ethanol plants. These meetings are focused um, on farmer and landowner audiences. Um, that way we can describe the, the policy drivers that are underway currently in our country that can transform the ethanol industry. Uh, we've done a, a couple of these in-person meetings, and then we will take a little pause through harvest and do a couple couple more as we get toward the end of 2023. I am happy to not only have Haley here with me today, um, but we also have Brad Stotler, who is the Director of Public Policy at Illinois Corn. Brad is on the line. Hi, Brad. And he'll also be joining us at the end um, for our question and answer, um, because it's very important that you know he works hard every day for the Illinois corn growers on all of these issues in the policy space. And I think he's the best one to answer the questions that you all may have. So thanks, Brad, for joining us. Thanks, Lauren. So we're here to talk today uh, about the importance of and the economic impact of reducing the carbon intensity score of corn, um, as well as new markets and demands for climate smart grain across our country. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, this has been my joke in these in these meetings, but I was prepping these slides um, the other day at home and I have a second grade son and he said the 80s, what are we talking about, Abe Lincoln? So no, we're not talking about Abe Lincoln. We do have to focus a little bit on our history in the Lurkins household, not talking about Abe Lincoln. Um, and when we're talking about the 80s, there's a lot of um, you know great things about the 80s. Brad and I were joking about this as we were prepping, you know, that you have Hulk Hogan, you have muscle cars, you have mullets, which I can't believe are, are back in fashion. So a lot of great things about the 80s, but there's some things that are not so great about the 80s. And if you work for farmers like I have, um, and or if you are a farmer tuning in, then you remember some different feelings about the 80s. Um, and this is the beginning of our conversation today is really a look back at the history of where we've been um, with regard to corn, um, corn markets in our country. And so really what we're talking about is remembering back to 1986 when corn prices fell to nearly $1.50 per bushel. Um, I know you all don't have to see this graph to be reminded of that, but 
um, it is something that's important as we think about these conversations um, here today. And what changed? Uh, what changed for um, the corn industry? Well, um, we believe that uh, it's the ethanol industry. And you have a little bit of history here um, that talks about um, the, the history here, but the renewable fuel standard was created in 2005 and then updated again in 2007. And this created a boom in the ethanol market. Um, so you can kind of see here that that step up through the years on production capacity. These are numbers that are the million gallons per year. And you can also see that average capacity per plant just getting um, more increased over time. So not only do we have more and more ethanol plants all the time in the country, they have more production capacity and they're also just um, more efficient at what they're doing. So the industry has really um, grown, not only just in the state of Illinois, but nationwide um, since the renewable fuel standard. And, and what did that do to our corn prices? Well, here's just a quick look. Obviously, that, that uptick is in the year 2012. We know what happened there. We had a historic drought. Um, but when we look back at when the RFS started in 2005, we had corn prices at about $2. Then that, that RFS2 around 2007, we're up to $4.20. And when we look at the year 2022, we're at about $6.70. So that upward trend has really continued throughout the last several years. And what, what does it look like here in Illinois? A lot of you are tuning in from all over the state. So some of these names and locations may be more, more familiar to you than others. Um, but this is a great map that really shows the footprint of the ethanol industry here in the state of Illinois. Um, as we sit here today in 20, 30, 2023, um, we've got 13 different ethanol plants across the state. Um, that's 1.8 billion gallons of ethanol produced here in the state of Illinois um, using a, a demand of corn bushels totaling about 657 million bushels. So that means that nearly one third of corn grown in our state is made into ethanol today. That's a pretty astounding number when you think about um, where we were before the RFS uh, just in before 2005. All right, so we, we kind of covered there the history of the ethanol industry, the corn prices from the 80s. Um, we're now going to kind of pivot our conversation so that we can focus on something that um, is not as um, not exciting to talk about, but is very important when we talk about where we're headed into the future. And that is the several um, cumulative threats that we see um, on the ethanol market today. Um, these are things that are going to look very familiar to you um, if you've been engaged in farm groups um, over the last couple years and months. And really, these are cumulative. Um, and so let's go ahead and walk through them. First, we are talking about EPA. Obviously, the U.S. EPA has the regulatory um, uh, control over the RFS, but they also have other areas that touch the farm gate. Um, and that would include um, some of their recent proposals on an electric vehicles. Over the summer, we saw a proposed rule from the US EPA um, called the multi-pollutant rule, several hundred pages of proposed rule language, but a very important component of the rule talked about the federal government requiring by the year 2032 that 67% of all new light duty vehicles and trucks should be electric in our country. So that um, got the attention of many folks. Um, we'll talk here in a little bit about calls to action, um, but, but that piece alone, the, the taking away sort of that consumer choice and that freedom to make choice on the marketplace is really problematic um, for the ethanol industry when you start to see the light um, duty vehicles and trucks move toward electric. And as you all know, when you when you talk about in the automotive industry, when they're thinking about requirements that would go live in the year 2032, they're not starting to make those cars in the year 2032 or 2031. They're really starting um, the R&D years ago and also that production um, here uh, as we sit here today. Uh, as we're 
recording this webinar, um, national news is covering, you know, auto worker strikes because of this exact issue. So it's not just agriculture um, groups that have an, have an issue with what they see here, um, but it is the federal government really quickly nudging the industry toward um, a very different look. Um, the second thing that's happening, um, actually, uh, Part of it is open um, right now is actually another proposal out of the Department of Transportation. This is the National Highway um, Traffic Safety Administration. This is a proposal that would go hand in glove with the requirements out of the EPA. And this is all about the efficiency of the fleet, thinking about you know, lessening the um, reliance on foreign oil. But this also, from a DOT perspective, had um, is requiring about a 58% improvement in efficiency by the year 2032. Um, this also has very serious components of EV mandates kind of tied in to be able to meet those efficiency numbers by that same year that we're seeing um, in the EV proposal. And then the third area of work uh, is uh, largely based out of the state of California. I joke that no environmental uh, presentation would be complete without talking about the state of California. Um, but they made news when um, Governor Newsom uh, months and um, over a year ago announced an electric vehicle mandate. Also, much like what the language that we see, um, making a commitment by a certain year that, that a percentage would, would go um, toward EVs. Other states have also adopted that same policy. Um, now 16 other states have joined California in thinking about mandates at the state level. Um, we talk about California a lot uh, with regard to environmental regulation. Um, we talked about, you know, for any pork producers on the line, we talked about the impact of a ballot initiative um, in, the, in the view of Prop 12. But when it comes to the automotive industry, California is the biggest market for the, the automotive industry here in our country. And so it cannot be ignored when you have that industry um, or that state being joined by several others. Um, it does have a huge impact on what is available in the automotive industry as far as consumer choice. And then the, the final um, sort of threat that we're seeing here is really um, state low carbon fuel standards. Again, California sort of set the stage with their low carbon fuel standard, but we're seeing um, more of those happen, particularly along the West Coast of our country, Oregon, Washington. And when those states are setting their low carbon fuel standard, they are not necessarily thinking about Midwestern agriculture and foreign markets in doing so. They also have a very heavy bend toward the movement toward electric. So um, again, all of these are important and powerful as they stand alone. But when you see them all together and they're all coming really at the industry at the same time, they do have a significant impact. So, so when we think about corn and ethanol demand, we are seeing the potential for a bit of destruction um, from that cumulative impact of the proposed regulations. Just the effective EV mandate alone, um, we're seeing about a 1 billion bushel demand destruction by the year 2033. Um, as you know, those EV mandates were targeted toward 2032. And so this is something that is nine, 10 years away um, if we let everything stand. And of course, there's a lot of opportunity for folks to get engaged, and we'll talk about that here in a minute. We also have the concern when we think about um, corn production today versus corn production in the 80s. Um, you all know if you are farmers in the state of Illinois, and you have been for an, a couple of decades, that you know um, that the, the, the way we grow um, corn today has much less impact on the environment and we can be a lot more efficient and grow more corn with less land out of production. And so that means when we're thinking about comparing ourselves to the 80s that we can have um, a, a bigger impact and potentially harmful impact on um, at the farm gate economics um, if this demand is destroyed at this point. And it's not just corn growers that are afraid and, and farmer uh, groups that are afraid of what they're seeing here with the EV mandates. You also have um, economic professors and 
um, experts across the country actually weighing in on the larger impact here. Um, there's a reference on this screen out of the great state of Nebraska. Um, this is when the economic folks there were taking a special look at the EPA uh, proposal. And again, these are proposals that come out for public notice and comment. And then everyone in the country has about 30, 45, maybe 60 days to be able to dig in. Um, so you have the concept maybe that you think is coming out of the government. But when folks like this actually see the words on paper, then they really start to kind of crunch the numbers. And so the, the quote that sticks out of this um, July 5th um, piece of information is very important. And what it says here is, while the primary unintended consequence of more EV production and sales may be a dramatic decline in the value of farmland in the Midwest, such a decline in the price of corn would have profound implications for the financial viability of Midwestern farming operations and the nation's food supply. So obviously we're concerned about the price of corn. We're also though concerned about the value of farmland right here where we live and work and, and really a bigger Midwestern footprint and our nation's food supply all being compromised because of, and in this case, just a simple focus on just that first of the four uh, uh, threats that we had talked about. So, so obviously groups like the Illinois corn growers are not just sitting by idly letting these proposals move forward. There's a lot of fight against um, these mandates um, and, and they take the form uh, in a couple different ways. The first is that organizations uh, like the corn growers are filing substan substantive comments um, these would be comments that are filed in all of those dockets. So that would be EPA, that would be the Department of Transportation. And these are comments that are done individually by ag groups and also biofuels industry, the oil and other related industries. And then interestingly, um, coalitions that are formed from many of those groups across the sectors. Um, that's the, the thing I believe that is getting the most attention to farmers that I've talked to in the past couple years is that they're noticing a world where, you know, maybe in the RFS discussions, these are entities that are really pitted against each other and maybe, you know, filing comments against each other. Here they are aligning against this common threat that are the EV mandates. The second is, you know, we talk a lot about in, in agriculture, we talk about legislative advocacy. We also, you know, here are having discussions about the regulatory advocacy piece. Um, there is also the, the legal advocacy. So um, if groups like the Illinois Farm, or Illinois Farm Bureau or Illinois Corn Growers are going to weigh in in a public comment period, but then the rule becomes final and no one challenges it in our nation's court system, then it becomes the law of the land. And so it's just as important to show up in the docket as it is to be ready for your legal advocacy. And that is what um, the Illinois corn growers and other corn grower states have been doing. They filed three petitions in just the last year alone, challenging these mandates when those questions are ripe in our nation's court system. Um, and then obviously, because these are all grassroots organizations, the Illinois Corn Growers has called their own members into action on these proposals. Here's just a couple examples of um, those opportunities. This is all about sending farmer viewpoints and farmer comments into the dockets open by EPA. You can bet there are people on the other side of these issues that are weighing in in just the same way. So we get this question a lot when we talk about regulatory comment periods, but is it a numbers game or do people care more about substance? And the short answer is yes. <laughs> uh, it's a numbers game and it's about substance, um, but it really says a lot when you have hundreds, if not thousands of individuals taking the time to weigh in. We had that opportunity over the summer um, with a lot of the groups here in the state of Illinois weighing in. And then we also actually have an open opportunity right now with the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration's proposal. This is a comment period that is currently open um, until October 16th. If you're interested in taking advantage of that opportunity, um, we can get you that contact information from the Illinois corn growers. Um, but it, it cannot be, um, you know, dismiss the, imp the impact and the power that is behind farmer comments in these dockets. 
All right, so we've talked a little bit about the history. We've talked about the threats and what the Illinois Corn Growers is doing to combat those threats um, on their own in coalitions and using uh, member voices to amplify that. Well, let's talk a little bit about the opportunities that exist for ethanol today and as we look into the future. Um, one big discussion point is carbon capture and sequestration. And then we're also gonna talk um, about some federal policies that are encouraging carbon reductions, not just within ethanol production, but truly across um, multiple sectors of our industries here in, in the country. But we'll, we'll obviously focus on corn and ethanol. All right, so first um, we're gonna go ahead and show uh, three different videos from um, really the, the nation's leading expert when it comes to carbon capture and sequestration. This is a video from Dr. Sally Greenberg. She uh, has worked here in the state of Illinois for over three decades, focused on carbon capture and sequestration. She had a career at um, one of our state scientific surveys, the State Geological Survey based out of Champaign and spent a great deal of time navigating um, the work and the research that happened on ADM's site in Decatur. Um, so she has recently opened up her own um, business to be able to focus on this, but she is going to walk us through three different uh, videos here. Um, and the first is, is Sally talking to us a little bit about the process of carbon capture and sequestration. So we'll, we'll listen to Sally at, at this point. So carbon capture utilization and storage is a suite of technologies that have been brought together to achieve the objective of preventing additional carbon dioxide being emitted to the atmosphere. So I'll talk about it in parts. So let's talk about capture first. So capture can happen in two ways. Um, there's what we call point source capture, which is something that might happen at an industrial facility, an ethanol plant, something like that, where you have a large volume of carbon dioxide that you can prevent from being emitted into the atmosphere. Um, the second possibility is what is called direct air capture or DAC, and that's essentially an engineered process where you are almost vacuuming carbon dioxide that's already in the atmosphere. Um, you're, you're removing it through a, an engineered process. Once you have carbon dioxide captured, you are going to store that carbon dioxide as pure carbon dioxide. So you need to compress, dehydrate, and if there is some anything other than carbon dioxide in the stream, you need to separate that. Separation is, is done uh, one of two ways, either chemically through sorbents or physically through membranes. And, and that is part of the design of the capture system. Carbon dioxide, when it, for example, in ethanol production, when it's produced is at atmospheric pressure. And when you store it, you need it to be compressed to a liquid. In order to do that, you put it through a compression dehydration process where you remove the water and you essentially take it from um, atmospheric pressure to a thousand PSI at the wellhead. Um, and that gives that carbon dioxide liquid-like properties for storage. Once you have that carbon dioxide in that state, you're gonna transport it either by truck, by pipeline, or by ship from the place where you've captured it to the storage location. And then at the storage location, and, and you can do two things when, once you're transporting. You can either transport the carbon dioxide somewhere to be used, as in 
making a product with it, such as a building material or use it for enhanced oil recovery, or you can store it deep in the subsurface, um, you know, a mile or more beneath the surface in the rocks that are there previously described to, um, to act as your storage unit. So it's important that the carbon dioxide be pure CO2, that it doesn't have any water in it because you want to prevent any corrosion uh, with the steel and the system is engineered to be with chrome resistant steel and carbon dioxide resistant cement. So that's one of the ways that you protect the engineered system. And that carbon dioxide then is injected through a deep well, uh, maybe on the order of 7,200 feet deep. And then it is being um, injected through steel casing into the rock formation where it's stored. All right, um, we are now going to move on to a second video clip that we have. Um, this is part, I will say, of a larger presentation that Dr. Greenberg has done for the Illinois Corn Growers. If you would like to, to get access to the full webinar, um, you can contact the Illinois Corn Growers. Um, but we are, are just uh, including some ex excerpts for the purposes of today. Um, but the next uh, video will be Dr. Greenberg talking about the safety and the monitoring that occurs around the carbon sequestration and the well. A big part of the development of a carbon storage project or location is done through a process called site characterization. And that site characterization uses rock uh, samples that have been drilled, it uses seismic reflections, which is essentially like taking a picture or a sonogram of the subsurface. It's designed to understand the rocks in a specific location and determine their suitability for carbon storage. All of the data that is gathered in the site characterization process, which is used in the permitting process, is also used in the project process for monitoring. So it's important to understand the environment before the storage of carbon dioxide, during the storage of carbon dioxide, and after a project site closes. So that's done at different, at different depths. So there's monitoring that happens at the surface or very near the surface. So for example, shallow groundwater wells that might be drilled to 150 to 450 feet where you take water samples. And so you're testing to make sure that the water, the components in the water are not changing and don't, and, and show you that you don't have any contamination by something that shouldn't be there. The, um, there's also deep wells that monitor that, that directly measure where the carbon dioxide is in the subsurface. We also, I mentioned that you, you use seismic reflections and trucks to take essentially an image so of the subsurface. So what you do is you do that over time so that you end up with a four-dimensional um, time-lapse way of monitoring carbon dioxide and the CO2 as it is in the subsurface. And all of that information gets fed into models, and those models are used to predict and um, validate where carbon dioxide is in the subsurface. There's also um, monitoring equipment that uh, is a sensor for um, uh, CO2 at the surface to protect workers or, or uh, people who might be nearby. Last but not least, we have another final video of Dr. Greenberg talking about um, here in Illinois, uh, what our geology looks like, uh, making it an ideal location for carbon sequestration. Illinois has excellent geology for carbon storage. That is true for several reasons. 
the states of Illinois, Indiana, and Kentucky are underlain by what we call the Illinois Basin, which is essentially a 60,000 square mile subsurface feature like a dish that is filled with sedimentary rocks. So in Illinois, that uh, suite of sedimentary rocks, depending on where you are, is somewhere between, um, you know, can be as deep as 10,000 feet. So the basin, um, uh, as I said, underlies the, the entire tri-state region. What's another feature of the, of that is unique for Illinois is the package of rocks or the way that the rocks were deposited. So when you do carbon storage, you want two different rock types, one rock type which can hold the carbon dioxide that you're storing in it, and the other that acts like a seal or a barrier for to prevent that or to keep that carbon dioxide stored in the subsurface. So those two different rock types are typically sandstone, which if you think about um, sand at the beach, sandstone is all those grains of sand cemented together. And the carbon dioxide, which gets stored during the process of carbon capture and storage is stored in the spaces between the grains of sand in conjunction with very, very salty water that is also in place in, in those pore spaces, P-O-R-E pore spaces. Um, the second type of rock is a shale, and that is a very dense, impermeable rock that CO2 uh, cannot really move through. So one acts as a storage container, the other acts as a seal, if you will. In Illinois, those rocks are at the uh, very base of that basin that we were talking about. And so the rocks have very few wells drilled through them because they don't have any oil or natural gas associated with them. So the, the, these, this, 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 excuse me, this particular set of rocks is deeper than the oil and gas that we have in Illinois. So that means there's fewer human penetrations into those rock formations, which just make them that much safer as a storage location. All right. Um, again, if you're interested in the full presentation from Dr. Greenberg, feel free to reach out to the Illinois corn growers and they can get you that additional information. Um, at this point, we're, we're going to continue on with our discussion and really talking about markets that are encouraging that technology um, and that technology being carbon capture and sequestration. Um, the first is a set of tax incentives that are um, in place um, and were included in the Inflation Reduction Act. So this was the, um, the act that was signed into law last year in August of 2022, um, the Inflation Reduction Act actually extended or modified already existing renewable energy tax credits and adopted several um, new ones as well. So we're going to go ahead and just step through a couple of these and then give you an indication in the next slide about the overarching goal of the Biden administration, particularly when it comes to sustainable aviation fuel, which is something that's being discussed quite a bit across the country right now and obviously here in Illinois. So we'll, we'll cover a little bit about that as well. But um, just a little bit of background on these different provisions in um, the Inflation Reduction Act with regard to tax credits. The first that we will talk about here is um, Section 40B. That provides a tax credit for the sale and use of sustainable aviation fuel that achieves a life cycle greenhouse gas emission reduction of at least 50% 
as compared to petroleum-based jet fuel. So the 40B tax credit is available um, from the beginning of 2023 through the end of next year, the end of 2024. And it's a base credit of $1.25 per gallon. The, the next credit that we talk about here is actually Section 45Z. That will effectively replace 40B. So it would come into place um, right after. Um, it provides a very similar tax credit for the domestic production of clean transportation fuel, including SAF. And it would apply to fuels that are produced after the end of 2024 and sold before the end of the year 2027. So same sort of you know tax credit ranges. Um, and um, the only difference is that really that that change in years. So you're really looking out to the end of 2027. And then um, it is important to note that when we talk about um, those tax credits, we also here in the state of Illinois have an, a state level tax credit for the production of SAF. Um, that became effective this past summer on June 1st, um, and it is in, in place until January 1, 2033. There are some conditions in that tax at the state level, that tax credit, um, with regard to needing domestic biomass. So we're talking about the corn, the soybeans that are grown here in the state of Illinois. And then I want to go back up and talk about the um, Section 45Q. This is something um, with regard to the sequestration um, of carbon dioxide. So this is a tax credit that was modified and expanded under the Inflation Reduction Act. It first was brought into law in 2008 and has been amended a couple different times since that period. Um, but really it gives in tax incentives to folks that own carbon capture equipment um, and can capture that carbon oxide from an industrial facility like an ethanol plant and um, that they sequester or use it for certain purposes. Um, as Sally said in the videos, there are some industries that can put that to use without the need for sequestration. So a lot of different things um, are kind of building up here in that tax incentive discussion. Um, and, and really the only way uh, for something like corn-based ethanol to qualify is to hit that 50% or lower. And we'll talk about that here in a minute. But when you think about the customers of um, some ethanol in the future, including ethanol being made into sustainable aviation fuel, you've obviously got airlines as um, major customers of that new product. Um, these are global airlines or even um, domestic airlines that are making very bold um, commitments to reduce their footprint, um, their carbon footprint. They're looking at offsets, they're looking at credits, and they're looking at um, any sort of investment that can help them um, have a, a better impact on the environment. You've also still got um, discussions within the auto manufacturers, chemical companies, and also consumer product companies. Um, we had talked a, a bit before about how the tax credits are just one piece of what's happening across the Biden administration. Um, when the Biden administration took office, they had several executive orders um, across many issues. One of them was climate change um, and trying to position the U.S. as a leader in that discussion. Um, and so it's really a whole of government approach. Sometimes the, the aspects of government are not you know, super aligned. But one thing that we're seeing here is um, a commitment on the, with a, a big focus on this sustainable aviation fuel. Back in 2021, the Biden administration announced its goal of producing at least 3 billion gallons of SAF per year by the year 2030. Um, they also have this SAF Grand Challenge that was created for SAF to meet 100% of the aviation fuel demand by 2050. So if we think about 100% of the aviation fuel demand by the year 2050, that's close to 35 billion gallons. 
per year. As a reference point, the RFS accounts for 14.5 billion gallons of ethanol demand. So quite a, a jump there, um, but a, a very different future for what things like corn-based ethanol can look like in the future. All right, and we've talked a, a bit about this 50% reduction um, when you look at the footprint on GHG for, for petroleum-based jet fuel to be able to qualify and really unlock the sustainable aviation fuel tax credits, that red line that is jumping across your screen is really that threshold to open and unlock the new potential. So obviously on the far left, you can see petroleum jet fuel in the black and the impact um, on, uh, from a carbon footprint standpoint. Right next to it, you see corn ethanol to jet, just a, a little bit um, below that, but not quite to your 50%. Um, and then you see the jump um, below 50% if you're making corn ethanol to jet with the carbon sequestration. Um, in agriculture and in the work that, that I've done over the last 10 years when I was with the Farm Bureau and that a lot of work happens within the, the Illinois corn growers, lots of discussion on what we now call climate smart agriculture, but a focus, whether it's for water quality or, or carbon, all on um, the practices that are adopted at the farm gate, no-till, reduced till, the four R's of nutrient management, and also cover crops. So we get a lot of questions on how do all of those practices fit in to this conversation that we're having on sustainable aviation fuel. And really the fourth column over shows you how um, they how they can really um, decrease the, the carbon footprint of um, corn ethanol. Um, but not quite below the 50% that would be required to unlock the sustainable aviation fuel tax credit. So the most important thing is that when you com combine the carbon capture and sequestration technology with all of the practices that we've talked about for decades with our two climate smart agriculture, you really see the potential um, to, to really minimize that environmental footprint. Um, and with that, uh, with that sort of going underneath the 50% line that we had on the last slide, what we see here is that you really unlock a lot of new markets with the use of the carbon capture and sequestration technology. Um, a couple of them are listed here. One would be Brazil's low carbon fuel standard and the tariffs today are keeping U.S. ethanol out of that country. Um, with these changes, that, can, that entire market can be open. The second is a very important one, um, obviously the international SAF markets and the fuel markets, especially um, the country of Japan. Lots of conversation of, you know, do you have Japanese companies coming to Illinois because of all of these um, movements? You very well may. Um, and then you unlock the, the fuel market in their country. Um, the third are these future low carbon fuel standard markets that would include Canada and other states. We talked a couple slides ago about how California and 16 other states have their own low carbon fuel standard. If you really have this technology and you have um, corn ethanol playing a bigger role, those low carbon fuel standards can reflect that in other states. Again, we're seeing the push on EVs on the West Coast, but anything in the Midwest would probably have a little bit of Midwestern feel to it, and we would have the potential to fold this um, concept in. And then finally, higher blends of ethanol in your fuel tank. We know we want to um, continue to have that opportunity, um, even with these EV mandates as we push back. And the Corn Growers has been leading the effort in the state of Illinois and with their peers across the country um, on legislation like the Next Generation Fuels Act. Um, Brad is taking the lead for the corn growers, and that's why he's on to answer any questions you may have about that legislative advocacy. All right, so as we look, you know, over the last uh, hour or so, we've talked about a history lesson, not that y'all need a reminder of what happened in the 80s, but it was a very difficult time. We're also looking at how efficient you are today and what, how, how much worse some downturn could be um, now versus even in the 80s and what you experienced then. Um, but we also went through a number of threats coming at the ethanol industry and corn growers from multiple angles of government. And then um, we talked about some opportunities. And so when we close here today, 
um, when we look at all of the all of the effort, um, it's moving very rapidly, and the conversations are complex. The policy is complex. I mean, we've talked about agronomy and economics and fuels, um, all and, and geology, all in the last hour. So it is complicated, but. When we look at um, at everything today, we see that ethanol brought demand to corn farmers in the 2000s, and we're still able to grow that industry and the footprint of that industry here in the state of Illinois. Although there are numerous threats that are really um, are could potentially jeopardize the future of that industry, and so we truly have opportunities now to pivot the ethanol industry and to be incredibly relevant for years and decades and generations to come if we are able to look at and utilize carbon capture um, technology um, to reduce the carbon intensity score of the grain that we grow here in the state of Illinois and across the country. So with that, we want to say thank you for spending time with us today. Um, and we will stop there and take a couple questions. Um, I would like to invite Brad to join me back um, so that way he can answer questions that I cannot. Here, hey, Lauren. Perfect. Thank you, Lauren. That was a great presentation. And like she said, we are going to take questions during this time. So if anything sparked your interest during that presentation, feel free to send us a chat. We do have some to start off today. So this one probably for Lauren, but it says, will this meaning the opportunities throughout this presentation, make Illinois farm ground more sustainable? Well, I think that's a great question. I think we are we we are headed down that path anyway with the decade plus of conversations that we've had about those practices that we talked about, um, whether it's the four R's, no-till, cover crops. Um, I know that those come with costs, they come with challenge, they come with, in some cases, additional labor, but we have that happening and um, picking up speed across the state today. I think that alone will help us be more sustainable, however you want to define that. I think when we think about the environmental impact um, and, and the carbon sequestration added in, yes, I think that can be the case. Uh, the, the other thing I will add is that any conversation I've had in my 10 years of working with farmers in the area of sustainability is that they talk about um, the economics of sustainability. I can only, you know, continue to do these things and create food, fiber, fuel for the country and the, the world if I'm still in business. So, so really that economic sustainability concept of the crops we grow and the and the crop land that we that we manage. And so I think that also helps us still be relevant into the future from that sustainability standpoint. Thank you, Lauren. This is more of a question for Brad. It says, if you are not within the Mount Simon area, would you need to complete testing to see if your site is suitable for on-site storage? Or is that not possible? Could you say the first part again, Haley? Yep, it says if you're not within the Mount Simon area, so not within the Illinois Basin area, would you need to complete testing to see if your site is suitable for on-site storage, or is that not possible for those areas? Well, from my understanding of it, uh, is that uh, for the Class Six permit, you're going to have to have a geological feature underneath your location to use uh, to get that permit and have that well, and so you would have to be testing that. We know that the Saint Simon, the, the Mount Simon sandstone, is the area. Uh, that particularly is, it has the depth and the geological features to do that. And so uh, in those areas is where the, uh, so the, the geology is how you would be sequestering the carbon underneath the ground. Without the geology, you would not be able to sequester underneath with a class six permit. So going off of that question, can you explain what a class six permit is? Well, there are different classes, there are different classes of permits. Um, so we have uh, several two, three uh, different types of permits that are related to other types of mineral mining and uh, mineral extraction. The class six permit is a uh, the highest level, which is related to the carbon capture aspects um, and the CO2 sequestration. And so right now there is one or two um, class six permits uh, located in Decatur, Illinois. There are many more within uh, the country and our region. Uh, generally, and like I said, there needs to be specific geology and a very high threshold to get that. But the class six 
uh, permit is definitely is generally defined as something that's specifically related to the CO2 uh, sequestration. Thank you. The next question is, I've heard there are new FEMSA rules coming to ensure all this is safe, but companies are trying to get approval now so they don't have to adhere to the new standards. Is this true? That's a great question. We hear about this a lot. And so related to the FEMSA regulations, you uh, can think about it in a couple different ways. One is that, yes, there are new FEMSA regulations that are coming out. Uh, no one knows specifically when they're going to be coming out, but the general thought is that they'll be uh, coming in the fall of 2024. And so in the run-up to that, the agency has also um, issued certain guidances and other types of uh, um, indications to industry related to what those regulations will entail. Um, also, there are grandfather clauses within the FIMSA regulations, making sure that all pipelines are up to the most um, current standards. And so, uh, irregardless of how these, uh, when these pipelines are built, they'll have to be um, under FIMSA regulation and, and uh, meet all the FIMSA uh, guideline criteria. And I think finally, when you think about the timeline, when we think about the ICC filings and other uh, uh, types of timing, uh, you know, we're looking at kind of construction or if the company, we're not speaking for the companies, but they're, they're talking about a timeline of 2025. And so um, I think that uh, there is concern around that, that we want to make sure the pipelines are meeting all standards and would uh, meet all standards. But uh, the timeline is such where um, in mid 2024, the new regulations will come out. And I know the industry would tell you that they are definitely aware of what is coming down the pipe. Uh, for the FIMS, the, the new FIMSA regulations. Thanks, Brad. That was a great answer to a complicated question. But so another question, probably for you, Brad, so I'm going to keep bombarding you, but can you speak to the prospects of the GREET model being implemented versus the European model that's currently being used and the implications that this could have on ethanol and SAF? That's a very Good question. Um, so just for the viewers, we're talking about SAF, sustainable aviation fuel, and um, how those uh, lowering of carbon emissions are, are, are calculated. And so we in the industry, <clears throat> in the ethanol industry, as well as uh, Illinois corn growers believe that the GREET model is the gold standard for that. Uh, right now, we're waiting on various uh, government agencies to come out with guidance on what sort of life cycle modeling will take place as it relates to the tax provisions that were talked about earlier in the uh, presentation. So the different 45 Z and Q type of um, and 40 B types of, of um, scenarios. And so we're waiting on Treasury to come out specifically on that. Uh, we as an industry are looking and, um, and advocating for the Greek model to be used. The ICAO model is a European model that's used, and we uh, believe is it is not as uh, concise as the GREET model, and so we're hoping that Treasury Department makes the right decision. Thank you. Another question from our viewers here. Is there any debate of property rights associated with the capture once it is, once it is in the ground? Did you say that again? Yep. It's, is there any debate of property rights associated with the capture once it's in the ground? Absolutely. I think knowledge is power. And I always tell folks that they should be aware if you're in the vicinity of an ethanol plant and that ethanol plant is looking to do carbon capture, then you as a farmer should realize that your pore space uh, could be valuable to them. And there will be um, a cost that you, um, a monetary value for your pore space and the landowner is uh, the, the severability of that, that there's no severability. So there would be the landowner's rights to the poor space. I mean, you should be aware of that. And there is value. Definitely. Another question, if Illinois ethanol plants are able to sequester carbon, will that make them more competitive among plants that do not have access to the geology that Illinois has? I think uh, the ethanol industry would tell you that, that, um, nearly all ethanol plants are looking uh, at this technology, whether it's located in the Mount Simon sandstone or a geologic area that can do this themselves, or they're looking at pipelines, which as we all know has created some controversy and, um, and, and for good reason, people should be cognizant of property rights, et cetera, that are associated with that. 
So I think that um, ethanol plants that are actively going to uh, pursue sequestration without pipelines will have an advantage perhaps to those that do not because we talked about the markets that could be accessed earlier in a, in a previous slide. And so if you're making, so ethanol and the ethanol industry that's able to lower their carbon intensity will have access perhaps to lower carbon fuel standard uh, markets as well as certain countries that are uh, that have regulations on the carbon intensity of their fuels. And then uh, the feedstocks with lower carbon intensities can be made into, into uh, other types of products, value added products like SAF. So yes, um, ethanol plants that are, that are pursuing carbon capture types of technologies will have um, access uh, compared to others that are not um, creating those uh, for carbon markets. Hey Haley, Thanks. if I could add, yeah. I add to that a Please little bit do. too. Um, Brad did an awesome job of, of explaining within the ethanol industry. And I think, you know, it's important to also think about other industries, right? So this technology, um, carbon capture sequestration is part of a dialogue across the country and across multiple other industries. Um, you know, whether it's refining, cement production, uh, power plants. So, you know, I think at least in my perspective, agriculture has um, a need to make sure that it remains relevant, particularly with regard to ethanol production. Um, there will probably continue to be those discussions in other industries as well. So I think it's just important for the, the corn farmers on the line to think about competitiveness across multiple industries as well and making sure that we're thinking about ag in the future as well so so i think brad has said it before in some of our discussions of you know um tides and ships and you know the whole industry can benefit with this technology but we also do need to think about the other industries out there as well that will, would want to be using this technology as well Definitely. Thank you both for your input. That was that was great. And then one more question to round out our time here. It is, if the GREET model is utilized, will it still be necessary to utilize carbon capture and storage to capture that tax credit? I think Lauren could take this one or I can kind of jump in. But uh, generally, when you think about that slide related to uh, four R's, other types of agricultural practices that lower carbon intensity of fuel and kind of meeting the lowering of the threshold. Um, so any life cycle analysis would, would show, so the GREET model is the life cycle analysis that would show the reduction of that carbon intensity. And so we as an industry believe that is the gold standard to that. Um, other types of, of modeling reflect the carbon intensity slightly different when they consider land use and other sorts of issues. And so um, I think to answer your question, I would have to see kind of comparisons of the different life cycle analyses of the different models. But generally in our industry, we um, advocate for the use of the GREET model because it is the most accurate, the most up-to-date version of that, um, of that process. Yeah, I think, you know, if we think back about the slide um, that I can't click to right now because um, I'm technologically challenged with it. But if you think back to the slide with the red dotted line across showing that 50 percent, the 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 combination of things that brought this industry far below that line um, is really the combination of carbon capture and sequestration and those practices. So. Um, I think that's the future. That's the future that um, really unlocks the majority of these opportunities that we've talked about today is the world that we can have the combination of not just the climate smart practices, but also this technology that we're talking about here today. Well, great. I think that was a perfect question to end on. And I thank you both for your expertise today and such a great presentation. If you do have any more questions that weren't answered during this time, feel free to reach out to us. We would love to follow up and um, continue to educate just like this the, was the point behind this presentation. So thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Brad. And um, we hope you all have the rest, a great rest of your day. Thank you.